keeping the lights down. There's still lights coming in from the window. All right. Chapter 6, On the Way, Where? Part 3. Later that evening, Binder and Dreher stirred and began moving about just as everyone else had finished eating and were preparing to get a good night's rest themselves. Dreher took the first night watch and was lingering portside searching the horizons in every direction with a pair of scanners. Binder took control of Sunshaft, Aurelis from Percy, so that the Mahekian could get some well-deserved rest. Dreher and Gabriel spoke quietly together in the hall, discussing their options, and Drott was below, still sleeping and purring. They had made small talk with the crew throughout the day, but conversations were short and purposeful. He found that sitting in the spinning hammock armchair suited him, and so, just as sunset, he was relaxing there when Percy came below deck and squatted nearby to reorganize his small pack of supplies. Day stared at the strange-looking man curiously. He wore a gray hooded robe that was tied about the waist by a white braided cord, a crystal heat saber, his only weapon, hung from a clip on his belt, Though he looked young, his hair, like most Mehekians were, was characteristically white, trimmed short and neat upon his oval-shaped head. Like all Mehekians, he wore a thin pair of dark eyeglasses, like a band across his face, protecting his deeply recessed, light-sensitive eyes. His pale white skin glistened as if covered with, by a crystalline rubber. Good evening, your highness, Percy said, working diligently with nimble fingers. Instead of fingernails, the Mahekian had retractable claws resembling those of an eagle's talons. Are you traveling well this evening? Day nodded. I saw you in the king's chambers the night of the secret council, he said. Yes, Percy answered. I saw you there as well. We had a busy night that night. Day was astounded how clear the voice seemed, since Percy had no mouth. We have no Mahekians in my palace uh, back home in need, he said, that I was aware of. They are rumored to live in secret places there, but all I have seen of your race are pictures. I am intrigued now that I have met you and seen your kind here on the mainland. Ah, Percy said. Curiosity has surfaced. Well... We are by nature a peaceful and reclusive people, your majesty. Content to live quiet lives away from the rest of the world whenever possible. Mead must be a very peaceful island then if my brethren are that well secluded. It is, he answered, or at least it was when I left. Let us hope it remains so, the master pilot replied. And from the tone Day received, the Mehekian was internally smiling. So what have you learned of my people then, sire, if you have not had the benefit of associating with us? Much, but whether it is true or not is up to you to say. I was always curious about your people in my studies. I learned that you are a noble elder race, origins unknown, ancient and, as you said, solitary, kind to a fault, but can be ruthless and deadly if need arises. Humble, thoughtful, and generous by nature, but fierce in battle and loyal to the end. Artistic, prolific, Mehekians are the kingdom's collectors of knowledge. Librarians, Percy suggested. Yes, librarians. You flatter me, your highness, the Mehekian said. Your insight and observations are very astute. I am most honored by your words. Well, in brevity, I suppose. However, I am sure that my limited knowledge does not scratch the surface of the depths of Mahekian history and lore. Day nodded, smiling. It is a comfort, though, knowing you are on board, he said. May I ask you a question? Please. I'm puzzled. How is it that I can hear you speaking so clearly? Can you explain it to me further? 
Percy looked at him. You have not been taught how Mahekians communicate? That is through a sort of mental project projection it's an, uh, uh, instead of sound. Well, yes, in a simplified manner, that, that, that it is. Day's brows tightened. Then how is it that I can actually hear you? I am projecting to you. Day considered this. N no, I can actually hear you the same as I hear anyone when they speak to me. That is the effect, yes, Percy explained. Whether sound comes as waves to your ears or you are projected to mentally, these thoughts, these messages are still translated in your brain the exact same way. However, a Mehekian may choose with whom he speaks at will or with whom he does not speak. He may choose his own voice or imitate another. The projection is as controllable as one's own imagination. And we hear each other by feeling those projections in our minds. And you can hear me. Oh, we can hear you telekinetically as you speak. All sounds have a distinct vibration. Each voice, each sound as a different vibration that we Mayhekians, to a certain degree, can register both in our minds and with our skin. As you probably know, we breathe, hear, taste, and smell through our skin. We can gauge our temperature, detect uh, changes in pressure and altitude, which aids in weather prediction, sense movement in the air, light density, life direction, water direction, heat, electric fields, vibration, and more. It's very convenient and useful. Can you read my mind? <laughs> no, Percy said, as if he had answered this same question many times before. Only audible sound. Can you change colors? To a limited degree, Usually from intense emotion rather than intentional camouflage, though, if that is what you're asking. That skill seems to be passing from us through the ages because of neglected use. It must have been an important defense mechanism in the elder days. Jameson Day smiled and shrugged. Thank you for today's lesson, Master Percy. I found it very enlightening. You're welcome, the Mahekian replied, bowing his head. You are both an honorable and an inquisitive king, Jameson Day. Next part. The next morning, breakfast was served in the waning dark just hours before sun's up, with just a hint of pink and fiery orange easing from the bleak edge of the otherwise cloudless eastern sky for them all to see by. Dreher had been cooking, and a Grand camp chef he was, too. He had seasoned soft-boiled turkey eggs for each of them and had warmed a roasted ham on a spit over a small hickory cooking pit in a small kitchen area that opened on a retractable shelf to the outside of the skycraft. The aroma of the smoking ham teased both nostrils and bellies. There was warm, bitter bread for everyone with pats of melting butter and jars of honey set on the side. The tea was fresh and hot, except for Percy, who always ate his meals in private. The rest of the company ate together on the rear deck, even though it was windy and cramped. It was the only area on the fighter craft large enough for them all to sit in one place. As they were finishing up, they all gathered for a brief meeting. Dreher Fregood relieved Percy from the helm so that he could excuse himself to go below and eat his breakfast privately, as was the want of his race. Dreher swung Sunshaft Arielis angling skyward, arching in an upward circle and then accelerated, leveling off low in the sky, cutting hard just above the treetops. The troop took a quick vote and unanimously elected Gabriel, temporary leader of the expedition, expedition in Deadland's absence, with Dreher as his advisor and first mate. Okay, 
let's get officially acquainted, Gabriel said to the small group. His first order of business was to tell them his place in the story so far, beginning with his discovery of the lost Mehekian city of Swaria Talu, which enthralled a lot of them, particularly Dreher Freygood and Master Pilot Percy, who was listening intently from just below the galley door. He described it to them and pointed out its location on a map so that if he could not for some reason ever return there, at least others would know of its existence and someday make time to report and explore it. Then he described in detail the circumstances surrounding the discovery of young King Day in the coils of the snake, his rescue, and of the vicious leg wound that he had treated. He told the story of their difficulties and travels, and of the assassins Habad and Terzda, who most had heard of. He told of the battle on the cliff, and of their arrival in Tungulin, bringing them up to date. Day then took his turn as well, going back even further, describing his ordeals before meeting Gabriel in the jungles of the Galathian forest. He described his last days in the Palace of Mead, the final meetings where all agreed that it was time to depart for the mainland, the journey across the White Sea by ship, the loss of his crew, and the harrowing events with Habad and Terzda, including his miraculous escape aboard their assassin's craft. The crew was fascinated with his story, hanging on to his every word. In fact, Dreher had himself a goblet of wine to cheer the adventures. It was too early yet for any of the rest of them to indulge. And so for now, in the most simplest terms, we are heading east to Gorn, Gabriel relayed to them. I spoke throughout the night with Dreher Freygood, and after much consideration, we believe we've come up with what we both agree is a good initial plan of action in Deadland's absence. Dreher, you can explain more if you will. Dreher nodded to the crew. Well, truthfully, we are going on what I would call an optimistic uh, supposition. Unfortunately, that's all we really have at this point. Deadland and I spoke often in the past few years and became very close. As friends do, we spoke of things both professional and personal. <clears throat> Months ago, Devlin told me about the recurring dream that he kept having, a dream that both moved and haunted him. He believed it to be relevant in some way as of yet unknown, he said, and, using his own word, prophetic. He told me that in his dream, his ears had been drawn eastward, like to a calling of some desperation, or as from some ethereal voice, weak and uninterpretable, from far beyond our borders and all the way to distant Gorn. He spoke of this dream to me several times, but it never occurred to me until his recent disappearance and our current plight that, that, that this vision could be in some way relevant. I realized that it's not much, but knowing the precognitive Visions of wizards, I believe it's the best that we have. Binder scoffed quietly. Dreams, he mumbled. Day, however, felt a very slight relief hearing this news. At least it was something, a direction. He chose to believe. To go on. To do what exactly, Commander Binder inquired. Firstly, to safely elude all eyes, Dreher answered, and to keep the king safe. For the time being, we'll leave it at that. And more secrets. Wonderful. Nothing like being out of the loop. Near midday, they paused briefly at a rugged cliffside outpost for more food and supplies. Near the way road, they briefly spoke to a group of young men passing by who had already heard about the previous day's occurrences at Tungulin inspiring them to volunteer and to take up arms and join the fight there as soon as was possible. We want to join the crew, 
of a Tungulan warship. We heard that several brigades have left for battle already, said one eager lad, no more than 18 years old. We heard that several Tungulan warships have departed to the west and southwest to bring the battle to the rabble Garnians infidels there. We want to do our part. The Sunshaft crew fearfully wished the eager young patriots much luck and honor before departing. If this was the harbinger of what was to come, it was surely premature and disheartening. They spent the day on board organizing their meager belongings and assigning basic chores, such as cleaning, piloting the ship, and night watch, all shifts done equally on a rotating basis. It was important for them to keep busy with the, some semblance of order and discipline to keep them from thinking too much and getting antsy or frustrated. In the meantime, keeping to plan, they flew in a direct line toward the southeast, toward distant Gorn. After dinner, as they crowded into the cabin to split a bottle or two of Dreher's potent wine to lighten the spirits, the conversation turned to the events of two nights before, when Dedlin, Dreher, and Binder had gone off to investigate the median skycraft tiger amongst the marauding gog boars of Bondoon. Everyone was most interested to hear what had happened, and Dreher and Binder were happy and eager to oblige. First and foremost, before even getting started, Binder defensively reiterated that beforehand, not only had he made his point to anyone listing that Dedlin should not have gone along in the first place, but that he had told both Dedlin and Dreher themselves, while aboard Stardear, in the most adamant terms, that the whole investigation in the forest at night on foot thing was an extremely bad idea. And Dreher concurred. Yes, he was quite clear on that. Now, in retrospect, it appears that the commander's stodgy, overbearing advice may have been wise. Stodgy? Over. Now we can get on with it, Dreher said. And he presented the story to them all in full detail. Dreher was a natural, masterful storyteller. It was a craft he had perfected over many years traveling the kingdom as a wayward minstrel, and so everyone hung on to each and every word. When it came to the part where the three were racing up the hill to escape the cattle wolves, Binder took over. Suddenly, we heard a lot of missile fire upon our heads, which momentarily disoriented us. We then realized that the Garnians had returned and that they were destroying the Gargmore fighters as they rose from investigating the Tiger. Their burning ships crashed down through the trees, falling to the ground all around us. We were perplexed at first, but then we understood. The Garnians wanted to ensure that they destroyed anything and everything that the Gargmore soldiers might have found there. And every one, Dreher added, they could not risk any messages from me reaching Tungulan or any potential evidence from the wreck reaching Garwin in Bondun. They had to be sure that nothing from the tiger was left intact. So they destroyed every last Gogmor, then blamed the attack on Tungulan. Why shouldn't Garwin believe them? The Garnians have been supplying Bondun with weapons and ammunition and supplies for years, while Tungulan only offers him trade sanctions and Territorial legal skirmishes. <coughs> they made an alliance, Garn and Bondun, and Garwin wrongly trusts them. Once the Gargmores were cleared from the sky, the Garnians dropped a firebomb on the tiger, destroying it beyond any hope of recognition. Ruthless, efficient, and thorough. By all accounts, they succeeded, Binder groaned. We'll never know who or what was aboard the Tigra now. I am sure that Dedlin found something before we left, Dreher said. He was clenching some maps and some documents that he had managed to seize from the flames in the lower hold of the ship. His very cape was on fire from the feet. I'm sure he could have shed some light on that mystery. Well, I, for one, will not believe that Dedlin Dane ended up in a wolverine's belly, Gabriel said. Well, nor I, 
said Dreher. I know him too well. He's far too wily for that and stubborn. Well, how did you two escape the Wolverines if Devlin didn't? Day asked them. We found Star Deer just moments before the Wolverines reached us, Binder said. Dreher climbed up first and I followed. A Wolverine tried for a bite of me, but got a heel in his mouth instead. I'm sure he lost a few teeth. But the beasts gnawed off the bottom rungs of the ladder before we could get away from them. One held on for nearly an hour, growling and twisting in the air as we waited nearby for Devlin's return. Hateful beast. We searched for the wizard for the rest of the night, while at the same time eluding the Garnian searchlights, Dreher said. We never found a trace of him. With that solemn thought, the conversation ended. Dinner dishes were done and evening chores were finished. That night seemed particularly lonely. A bit of rain passed after midnight, but not much more than a sprinkling. There was not much to do as the following day wore on, or the next. The crew took turns at the helm, always steering in a southeasterly course. They began discussing possible options. Once they reached twos, they thought about trying other wizards in that territory, possibly in Oleader or Bustling Arisia, on the possible location of secretive caves. They agreed to attempt to reach King Bantu by message sphere, the first chance they got to see how the city was faring since their departure, or to see if there were any word on the wizard. Ott remained acceptably cordial enough when addressed, yet rather unsociable and distant at all other times. He did not mingle with the crew, but always eyed them with some degree of disdain and scrutiny when he was not staring pensively off the back of the ship at the distant horizon. Concern about his demeanor was often a quiet topic of conversation among the rest of the crew. Day, however, generally defended the Thordian. He seemed to feel oddly comfortable around him, as he would a bodyguard, and in fact, in some strange way, felt as if he had seen Ott somewhere before, although that could not have been possible. Two more days passed without any change, even in the weather, which remained mild. The trees in the forest below them were mostly the broad-leafed, deciduous variety. The streams were green and heavy from recent rains. The few fields, crisscrossed with animal trails, were speckled with yellow flowers. There were rising buttes of stout rock along the eastern horizon, sheer walls of smoky granite, similar to the Galoth rock, but yet similar in stature and girth, diminishing off into the northeast and southeastern mists. The trees below began to thin, and in some places they cleared altogether, revealing wide expanses of knotty hills covered with the luscious green grasses Day could ever remember seeing. Percy took Sunshaft Arielis down toward the earth, closer to the fragrant meadows. Guiding the craft masterfully between the sparse, thick bodied oaks that grew in random clusters in the folds of the lumpy hills. Gabriel spoke a few words to Percy, and the Mehekian nodded in agreement. Sunshaft began slowing as Percy drew back on the acceleration bar. The skycraft glided to a smooth stop just off the crest of a grassy knob hovering about three feet above the surface. A sparkling stream gurgled down near the base of the odd knotted hill, forced to twist and drop over the irregular stones in a series of falls and clear pools. Why are we stopping? Binder asked, coming up from the lower deck. Water, Gabriel answered. They had traveled nonstop for several days. We're nearly out. Jer looked around the area suspiciously, as if something there was making him uncomfortable, though he could not quite place it. He hopped over the side into the tall grass, which rose up over his knees, and surveyed the area around him. From the port side of 
Sunshaft Arielis. He opened a panel and began unrolling a vacuum siphon hose, rolling it over his arm and shoulder in loops, keeping a ready eye on their surroundings. Percy clambered over the side to assist him. You want to get out and stretch your legs a bit? Gabriel asked Day. It might be a long time before we stop again. Across the hillside on the opposite side of the creek, Jameson Day could see the remnants of an old crooked road lined with weather-worn stone markers that ran somewhat east to west. It was all but covered with the lush grasses and peat, probably unused for years. He unlooked. He looked at the windswept reeds swaying all about beneath Sunshaft Arielis. No, he answered. There was something unwholesome about the knotted hills that he did not like, as if they were as if they harbored snakes and spiders. I'll wait here. See you shortly then. Gabriel, Percy, and Dreher headed down the hill to the stream, pulling the siphon hose along with them. Binders stood near the vacuum motor and awaited their signal. Sir Althagoras was lying prone on the back bench, watching the dark trees behind them while grooming himself, licking the fur on his forearms with his rough sandpaper tongue, and combing his long white whiskers with his clawed, paw-like hands. Day looked closely at the Thordian, studying his striking face, soft cream-colored fur, surrounded by golden brown with a distinguishable white stripe in the middle of his face. The fur of his entire mane was wreathed with black tips. He had fierce yellow eyes and large white canines which showed only when he spoke. All in all, a magnificent beast. His face seemed particularly tense since they had stopped. His ears occasionally pricked up as if he sensed something beyond the trees out in the brush. Yet, look as he might, Day did not see or hear anything out there, but he was curious just the same. He drew in closer to Ott, joining the Thordian near the aft of the ship. The Thordian bowed his head respectfully as the young king drew close. You keep staring off the stern of the ship, though there's something back they're following us. I assure you, we took all precautions. You can never be too cautious, Your Highness. I'm wondering, Pythagoras, you look strangely familiar to me. Have we met somewhere before? Is that even possible? He asked. He leaned out over the rail, looking into the same dark trees. My homeland has many Thordians, so I could be mistaken. I shifted in his seat, adjusting the strap, which pinned his Aerojet rifle to his back. No, we have never before met, Your Highness, he answered with the odd accent Thordians had when pronouncing human words. Still, I have always served the good kingdom of day, as I will continue to do to the best of my abilities. Day continued to study him curiously. You choose to remain distant from the rest of the crew. Why is that? You may notice the others grow suspicious of you. Ott spoke slowly, choosing his words with precision, as he always did. I have found that sometimes it is good to be suspicious of one another sometimes. His long lashes batted at a gray moth that fluttered near his face, especially during these days. I am cautious. That is all. I am a stranger to this land. It takes time and experience for authority to grant trust and friendship to strangers. I beg your patience, Your Highness. Gabriel called from the hollow. The hose was in place in the stream. Binder kicked on the vacuum motor, and the craft began taking on water in her two lower holding tanks. Binder checked to make sure the filters were properly activated and functioning correctly. I understand that, Day said. I do. I've had to do the same thing myself. I traveled, I traveled with Gabriel for many days before I even spoke a word to him. Ott smiled. Day saw a mouthful of sharp canines. But soon it will be time for you to tell your own story as well. We are all curious about you and why King Van Tu placed you in this fellowship. 
My story will be told very soon, Your Highness. That, I promise. Binder came up from the lower deck and saw them speaking together. Well, since you have, uh, you seem to have nothing to do, once again, Mr. Ott, would you care to take a break from Sonny and get out and stretch your legs for a bit? All four of them? Perhaps have a drink of water from the stream, have a bath? He asked. We could uh, set you up a hammock in the shade, or you could just stay here and relax and groom yourself while everyone else does all the work, as usual. Forgive Binder and his sarcasm, Day said, frowning at the commander. He's still cross for having to leave Tungulin, and he has the manners of a bear. Besides, he should learn to be more civil, especially when the one he is addressing is already active in conversation with someone else. My apologies, Binder said, nodding to King Day. I meant no disrespect, Your Majesty. It's just frustrating to watch this one recline back here on his furry backside, watching every sunrise and sunset, day after day, doing little more than scowl at the rest of us while we're doing his work. I mean, none of us here know him. We don't know where he's from or why he is here. <coughs> I just don't trust him. Never like Thordians, and with good reason. And this one has given me no reason to start. I do not serve you, but told Binder blandly. Therefore, I do not need to answer to you. Before Binder could reply, Jameson Day stepped in, speaking sharply. It would serve you both well to attempt to get along together while aboard this ship. It is far too small for you to try to choose corners to hide from one another. We may be together for a while, and you may very well end up depending upon one another for your very lives soon. Do you have... <laughs> if you have an issue, either of you, I insist you work it out diplomatically as gentlemen warriors. This crew must work together as a team while we travel together. We're all on the same side here. I'm not so sure of that, the combiner said. I, for one, shall try, Ott growled, eyes on the angry commander. Binder, so what do you suggest then? Should our guest, who King Van Tu himself requested to join us, be ejected from our ship and be off on his own? Here? Uh, no. Of course not. I also apologize, Binder said. I, I have a lot on my mind. We all do, Commander, Jameson Day said. But what say we trust King Van Tu for now? I suspect that our new field, our friend here, has purposes we have yet to discover. If he chooses to save his words and strength for the time being, it could be for a good reason. I, for one, understand the importance of keeping secrets. Ott slowly rose, eyes squinting toward the trees beyond the rise of the hill behind them, neck craned and fur bristling on his broad neck. Both Day and Commander Binder followed his gaze. And at this opportune moment in my own defense, I would like to point out that I have not been as idle as I've been accused of being nor have I been able to enjoy a single sunset since the morning we left. This is probably a good time to inform you both that we are being followed, as I suspected, and have been for days, although no one else has seemed to notice it somehow or care. Day looked back into the trees, where Ott had been staring earlier. Followed? What do you mean? By whom? By them. The Thordian answered, discreetly directing his glance to a spot low within the trees. You can see them plainly now. Look closely, right there, where the bit of sky is showing through the opening above that clump of thickets. They're being careless. You can see them clearly now. Binder joined him at the rail. I, I don't see anything, Jameson Day said, squinting. Just below the middle terraces, about uh, 30 feet back into the trees, I replied. A ship. I see them, 
Binder hissed. Scouts. Probably Garnian. Damn, they followed us. I don't know how, but they've followed us. Well, don't be too conspicuous. They're using a small shadow craft, Binder said. It's a cloaked scout ship used for spying, maybe holding three soldiers. Wait, there's another. A one-man sky sled gliding amongst the first. I thought I briefly spotted a uh, the smaller craft uh, three nights ago, I told him. The larger one appeared only early this morning. You should have told us the moment you saw them, Binder snapped. I was the only one not assigned to watch for some reason, Rot, Ot replied casually. But I have anyway, since it is obvious that I have the best eye for this. I didn't report it right away because I had to be sure. Also, I wanted to test the abilities and, perhaps, loyalty of this crew. Loyalty of this crew? Binder snapped. There are Garnian spies in the highest offices kingdom-wide, Ott replied. How can I be sure that there are none among this ship? You are all as strange to me as I am to you. Binder frowned at Ott. You're a fool. The Thordian continued. There were many Garnian scout ships tailing the other decoy skycrafts when we first left Tungulid. These two are the only ones I've seen since then. They are clever and careful until now and are armed adequately enough, but they know that we outgun them. They are merely scouts, information gatherers. They are monitoring Tungulin traffic, learning trade routes, potential escape routes, and defense strategies. Or they could be looking specifically for us, Day added. They're certainly taking every precaution, Binder said, and they're more than likely know that we n know about them now. If they've seen us, they've seen you, Your Majesty, and there could be some suspicion at the very least. Hopefully they still believe you're not you, and that the real King Day is still in Tungulin uh, taking refuge. Because if not, as soon as they know that you are here, Every Garnian ship in Galgaria will be after us. We need to inform the others, they said. We need to get out of here. Can we outrun them? Um, we could sabotage them, Binder said, heading for the helm. He didn't want to raise alarm by shouting to Gabriel and the others. Chances are we could destroy them both right here before they made any contact with their superiors. Garnians have an excellent communication system, Ott advised, still remaining as calm as before. We would have to be swift, perhaps split up and ambush them from behind as well. Binder shifted the ship control out of idle, and the sunshaft Arielis began to slide down the rim of the hill toward the stream, as smoothly as melting butter off a biscuit. Suddenly the skycraft jerked and stopped, spinning a bit, but she would not budge another inch. What's wrong? Day asked, looking around. Are we snagged? On a stump or something? Binder raised the throttle, but Sunshaft Arielis would not respond to it. In fact, the craft began surging back up the hill in the opposite direction, as if being gently pulled. Impossible! The bottom of this craft is smooth. There's nothing extending, extending below to get stuck on anything. I saw no log to get stuck on. Ott and Day peered over the rail on opposite sides of the ship. I didn't like to look at this place as soon as I saw it, Day replied. It looked like snakes to me. Sunshaft veered slightly to the right and to the left, as if something from below was firmly tugging at it. Binder, looking over his shoulder at the spies in the dark trees, Increase the throttle. We're certainly either stuck on something and we're having major skycraft malfunction, he said. The whirring turbines began to rattle as the frequency rose, the exhaust pipes emitting a fine black smoke that began to cover the grass behind them with a dusty pale ash. Either way, not good. Not so hard. Whatever has us, if it lets loose, we're going to shoot into the clouds as if from a cannon. Day said, holding tightly to the vibrating rail. Ott volunteered to have a look below. 
He opened the starboard gate and hung his hairy head over the side. He glanced right and left. Suddenly he scrambled back, falling to the deck, rolling frantically backwards. From the open gate, a long green tentacle rose up, wrapping around the perimeter rail where Ott had just lay prone, and it pulled down hard enough to bend the plasteel bar. What is that? Day cried. Binder seized a fire axe from the cabin wall. It's a creeper, he said, as if this were the worst luck of all. The biggest one I've ever seen. He raised the heavy axe above his head and brought it down hard on the smooth tentacle. The thick rail bent from the blow. The wood beneath splintered, but the rubbery skin of the creeper did not sever. It was pinched enough, though, that it released its hold and disappeared back over the side. It's gone, Ott exclaimed. Oh, no, it's not, Binder replied. They're relentless. Two more tentacles rose up, gripping the rail on the port side. There's more of them, Day cried. It's but one creature, Binder said, pounding on the splotchy green and brown arms like a crazed machine, but with little or no effect. Two more tentacles had seized the rails. One hundred and eleven arms, he said between strikes. Sometimes more. Ott unwrapped one of the tentacles by hand. It retreated, then it rose a few feet away to tighten around the rail again. It feels no pain. Pain? It's a rubber plant, Binder answered, grabbing a wood saw from the nearby tool chest. A carnivorous plant. It lives in muddy holes under the ground, preying on whatever passes by. If we can't free this ship in the next few seconds, this insepid creeper is going to pull it down into the ground and attempt to eat it. Gabriel, still hobbling on his bad leg, came up over the hill with the others just then, winding up the siphon hose around his shoulder and his arm. When he saw what was happening, he dropped the hose and quickly unsheathed his blaster. He fired a few rounds, but the huge creeper went unfazed. Two stumps waved ineffectively in the air, leaking oozy sap. Get out, he called to them. We've lost it. We can't lose the ship, Jameson Day cried. We can't beat this thing, Gabriel reiterated. I've seen these things devour golems. It's already damaged the ship beyond repair. It's already into the open water tanks. We can't lose the ship, Binder then repeated, sawing heartily at a rubbery tentacle that had seized a mooring hook. Look, he said, pointing into the trees. We've been discovered. Drear Freygood and Percy had reached Gabriel's side, and they all spotted the Garnian scout ships at the same time. The three of them encircled Sunshaft Ariellus, firing again and again at the creeper with their blasters. Many arms were severed, hewn and cut. Many more arms replaced them faster than they could be destroyed. They slid from muddy holes everywhere, securing themselves to Percy's floundering skycraft with hungry determination, pulling it steadily downward. Binder had left the craft at full throttle. It bolted again, stretching the rubbery coils that secured it. The earth below seemed to rise from the force, but the ancient creeper held on tight. Ott had been throwing as much of their food and equipment overboard as he was able. Percy and Dreher hurried to retrieve it before the creeper could. Jump! Gabriel called to them. And be careful where you land! Jameson Day did not hesitate for a second. He leaped hard from the failing craft and rolled into the grasses as yet another tentacle rose up beside him. Percy came to his aid and pulled him to safety. Ott sprang nimbly from the sinking ship, landing squarely on all fours, and then he leaped away in two mighty bounds. Binder was still on board, tossing guns and packs over the side. Forget about the guns, Commander! Gabriel called to him. We've got all that we can carry as it is. Save yourself. Binder nearly fell from the tilting deck just as a groping feeler brushed past his leg. It seized a loose blaster and pulled it over the side and down into a muddy hole. Beneath the ground, they could hear a rapid succession of shots before the gun fell silent. Binder leaped off and rolled away toward the others. 
The once beautiful sun shaft Aurealis began giving way, splitting and folding in half down the middle. The mighty creature pulled the skycraft's rattling air exhausts into the soft ground. The turbines, unable to take the pressure, ruptured at the seams, sending up a cloud of black smoke and ash. Having no thrust left, Sunshaft Aurealis yielded finally to the creeper, a great beast to a conquering predator. It began sinking into the earth like a dying ship at sea. The brainless thing thinks it has a huge meal, Dreher replied. Once it sinks its teeth into it, it's going to get a big surprise. By tomorrow, it'll reject the ship, and up will come a crushed chunk of useless wood and plasteel to the surface, Binder said. The crew gathered their belongings and sorted through them, minimalizing their packs. Percy watched his ship sink lower and lower into the earth, and wrapped with seemingly countless green tendrils. He was saddened by the loss of his ship, but true to his nature, he com commented that they were just fortunate not to have lost a member of the crew to this thing. Farewell, my son, Shaft Arielis, he concluded thoughtfully. What now? Ott asked. Does anyone know where we are or where we can find another ship? I know a place, Dreher said. Small town, but it's quite a walk. I think it's due east uh, of here still. But that serves our purpose well enough. I'm just not sure if there are any skycraft there large enough to bear the lot of us. Where is that, Gabriel inquired. Long Gray Bluffs? Dreher nodded. Gabriel sighed. He had no better idea. We're a long way from anywhere, he commented. Ironically, out of all of them, they seem to be the best of spirits. Firstly, I suggest we get off these bumpy, knobby, sneaky hills and onto that little road over there. It runs due east, as best as I can tell. At least we have an anxious escort, Dreher said, referring to the Garnian scouts still hidden back among the dark foliage. Even if we could take both of their crafts from them by force, we couldn't all fit aboard them. Uh, we should still de destroy them, Ott replied. No good can come from this now. We're sitting ducks out here. Binder picked up two heavy packs and several guns. I knew things would get bad, but not like this, and not this soon. What are we now? Five days out? Six? Jameson Day waved at a small gray moth that fluttered playfully about his face. Come on then, gentlemen, he said. Things could be worse. That's the end of that chapter. Next one coming up is A Wizard Story. <laughs>